Stan Mitchell, pastor, activist, uh, iconoclast. Um, first, I just want to welcome you to my podcast. You're the first person in this live setting. Wow. Yeah. I scored. Yeah. What people don't realize is we're sitting in my basement. It's, it's a nice basement. Well, it's got a big H back over there, but... I, uh, you and I have had a friendship, I think close to a decade, maybe yeah. a little shy of a decade. And uh, we went through a lot of things together. You were ahead of me a bit. So you helped mentor me in my own faith deconstruction. But Stan, here's my, here's my question. Um, What do the evangelical biblicists, you know, kind of our old community, when it comes to all the deconstruction that is happening uh, around them and prevalent in the states in America, what is it that they're maybe not getting as to what is happening all around them or why it's happening? Wow. I'm glad you started with an easy question. Might as well. What are they not getting about deconstruction, this phenomena? It's probably not a new phenomena, right? It's been around for a long time. But it's taking on its own iteration right now, coming out of the evangelical community, or on the periphery of the evangelical community. I mean, the language of what they don't get about it, I don't know that that's the approach that I would take as much as I would say their perspective on it is definitely different than yours and mine. I mean, that's an understatement. I mean, I, again, projecting back onto them because I was an evangelical biblicist. That was my entire life, five generations, six generations deep in that. What is deconstruction? Well, at its best, deconstruction was something we would have said we promoted in the you, sense... You mean when we were evangelicals? Yes, as evangelicals, we did say that we would promote it with the caveat, the unstated caveat, that you can deconstruct, you can disassemble the whole thing. It's seeking out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's kind of this necessary process that you go through with the understanding, the tacit understanding implied but absolutely mandated that you have to reconstruct and reassemble the thing back to its earlier form. You received it as an inherited faith, you deconstruct it, make it yours, but it has to get back together just like Humpty Dumpty, except now it has the nails and the glue and the cement of your own conviction. Yeah, but I, that, I mean, one thing you have on me that I don't have is five generations. Right. So I grew up in upstate New York, Italian Catholic. I was a born again convert in the, right in 1980, a leftover of the Jesus movement. So I would say, t t explain more to me when, when you say, um, even as evangelicals, you were allowed to deconstruct. I, and I know you get this, but I would have said, no, I'm trying to save you to evangelical theology. I, I wouldn't have said it that way. I would have said, I'm trying to save you to true Christianity. So what... Yeah, the deconstruction was offered those who had grown up in the faith. Okay. Someone who converted as a teenager or someone in their 20s or 30s or adult life no, but for those of us that inherited the faith generationally, okay. we had to take our own journey. But again, the assumption was, the mandate was, you have to come back. So that was, but I said, that's the best light on deconstruction. The negative light on deconstruction was, if you deconstruct and don't put Humpty Dumpty back together the way it was, you can disassemble the machine, but the machine's got to go back together to work. If you don't get the machine back together as it was, if you don't get the faith reconstructed the way it was earlier, then of course that process is, it falls under the category of deception. And now all of a sudden you have evil, malevolence, you have the devil, Satan, 
leading people astray, words like heresy, apostasy, believing a lie and being damned, all of those things. So that's the perspective of evangelical biblicists on deconstruction. This is someone being led astray and deceived by the adversary. Stan, one of the things I think our former world is missing. I think a lot of times when they describe deconstruction, I, I don't necessarily think they're wrong. Uh, the way they describe it, I have different feelings about it. Right. I go, you're describing it right, but I don't disagree with you, but about what uh, faith deconstruction is, I'm just there. But one of the things I think they're missing is something deeply theological, which I don't get. Here's what I mean. When asked why people deconstruct, they might say it's church trauma. And it would certainly include that. Uh, clergy abuse, which would, it would include that. Um, ecclesiastic um, extravagance, megachurches, or, you know, the narcissistic uh, pastor. They're not necessarily wrong that. But in their defense or apologetic, they never, it seems to be, they never turn it on their own theology. Meaning, the reason some people are deconstructing, a lot of people are deconstructing, because the actual theological constructs that we call the truth or historic orthodoxy is no longer making sense to anybody. That's the thing I think the apologists are missing. And then they double down on the orthodoxy. I think one of the hard things in that is I don't know any of my evangelical apologist friends, and I have them, who haven't in their own way done some measure of deconstruction. How so? Many of them have moved from fundamentalism extreme fundamentalism to a more moderate evangelical position. Everybody gets to deconstruct as far as they feel comfortable with, and everyone understands themselves to be the moderate between the extremes. I mean, conservative is anybody right of me, and liberal is anybody left of me, and that there's a narcissism in that for all of us. But, you know, when I look at my life, deconstruction, I was born and raised an apostolic Pentecostal in the denomination, the United Pentecostal Church. Now, that is a group of Pentecostals who broke off from mainline Pentecostalism, if I could use that phrase, in 1915, because our people, my ancestors, received a revelation about the Godhead. And we don't have to get into the weeds with all of that. The long and short of it is my group, the United Pentecostal Church, Oneness Pentecostal People, that denomination was founded in 45, believed even Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Holiness, Foursquare, other Pentecostal denominations were lost. My deconstruction began as a 10 or 11 year old boy, not trying to sort through, you know, deep apologetics. I was trying to wrestle with Uncle Bud and Uncle Junior and Aunt Charlotte and Aunt Barbara, these good Church of God, Assembly of God people who, by our estimation, our family was very divided. These people were going to hell. I stretched as far as I could between 11 and 13 years old, and my heart and mind widened to where I could accept that Assembly of God, Church of God people who also spoke in tongues may be included in the Bride of Christ. I lived there a while, and before too long, I began to have the same sensibilities and angst about Billy Graham and Max Licato and Chuck Swindoll, evangelical people who didn't speak with tongues. Meaning you started to go, how are they going to hell? Yeah, these good people, Billy Graham, come on, how was he right? Sure. I stretched as far as I could. Yeah. And I moved from Pentecostalism through the Charismatics to the Evangelicals. And then I began to read moderate Evangelicals like Campolo and Yancey. Sure. And I stretched as far as I could. It was always a stretching. Now, here's something interesting. 
Every group I left said my stretching was backsliding. Every group I came to said my stretching was growth. Of course. So your point is this stretching. Everybody does it. Yeah, right. And you go to the point where you're comfortable. Yeah, right. And then you make that sacrosanct and impose that same measure on every other person. Yeah, right, right, right. And so you, you think this is a lot of what's obviously going on as the current stream of American evangelicalism, it, how it's reacting to uh, kind of this faith-shifting, evolving, uh, faith deconstructing phenomena that we see. There's no way around the fact that for 2,000 years, Christianity at a cellular level is, is very much inculcated with fear about the afterlife. And the afterlife is generally vouchsafed for us by proper belief, not by works, but by believing the right thing. We have, for 2,000 years, there has been a heavy onus on believing the right thing. Believing the right or wrong thing is the difference between burning forever and living in celestial paradise. That burden on believing is something we do carry, again, at a cellular level. Right. So anytime we're stretching in our beliefs, there's always this undergirding trepidation that I could get too far out there and my relationship with God could be jeopardized by crossing the line. I, I've, I've journeyed with many groups upstream in this deconstruction flow. Every group goes as far as they can, and if you leave them, there's always this at least tacit acknowledgement that, hey, we were, we were doing fine, but the phrase is always, either stated or unstated, the phrase is you've gone too far. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, I think this could even uh, be with evangelical moral absolutism. Uh, certainly when you and I were evangelicals, we did believe there was a, a moral standard mm -hmm. and um, a moral absolutism. I certainly held that and uh, preached that. But yet when when we're intellectually honest about it, kind of using your point towards morality, um, the history of the Christian church has always been evolving its morality. It's always uh, changing. Have you read, um, are you familiar with the book Moral Combat by Marie Griffith? You've talked to me about yeah. it before and it's on my reading list because yeah. of you. Yeah, and basically she only covers the 20th century um, maybe a little post-Civil War and slavery, but basically her thesis is, is how American evangelicalism was always late to the party on things that everybody eventually agreed was a good morality, whether it was slavery, women's suffrage, black voting, birth control, um, Certainly, by the time you get to civil rights in the in the sixties, uh, interracial marriage, uh, feminism in the seventies, um, and now, of course, dealing with LGBTQIA plus uh, in the nineties till now, and you know it's kind of like um, even a conservative evangelical, a conservative evangelical, what sane conservative evangelical would stand in any pulpit in the United States and say a person with a Chinese background should not marry someone with a Caucasian background. No sane conservative evangelical minister would teach that today. Yet in the 1960s, um, that could have easily been done on interracial marriage. So my point is morality, you're stretching, uh, we're constantly changing and evolving and stretching, no? And we, of course, are. 
the insufferable thing about much of Christianity is, is, is first that it often is slow to the party. Often other pillars of society, whether that's geopolitical pillars, healthcare, education, the arts, they are often ahead of the game. I, I wish that weren't the case. I mean, we, we've always kind of thought that the longest leg of the stool was the church, the religious institution, but it's not true. We often come kicking and screaming to these recognitions. That's not the most insufferable part, and I, I'm not trying to be caustic here. The insufferable part is that when we finally do capitulate, give in, get painted into the corner, we act like we led the way. That's right. We burn, we, we almost burn Copernicus and Galileo at the stake, and then later we reflame the fire and make them a brazen statue to honor them. That's right. And the reality is often it's not the church through which the divine is speaking. It's other things like art and education and history. Um, you know, so, Stan, there's, there's partly a, a historical antidote to that. Often we'll hear our former evangelical friends when they like to look back on uh, the Civil War, the, uh, slavery, uh, and talk about abolition. Many times what's painted there is abolition was led by um, the Christians. It is true, but there's a big but to it. Most of it was what was considered progressive Christians of right. the North that would have been thought as apostate from evangelical Southern view. And so, so what people think is progressive, what evangelicals think is progressive now and apostate, the Christian abolitionists, they like to claim in retrospect if they had had that same mindset, would they have sided with them? So yes, it was Christians who were part of abolition, but they were considered the progressive Christians and apostates by many, if not most Southern evangelicals. My father is a dear man um, and I'm, I'm fine for him to see this podcast. We have an open relationship about our differences. But he asked me a few months ago, he said, why? Where did all of this come from? This deconstructive process, whatever you call it. Where did it come from? Your advocacy for LGBTQ people in the church. He's asking uh, globally, universally, or He's why my son? Why, why is my... Why what is happened to you? Uh, to my son. Yeah. I said, you did. He said, I didn't do this. I said, yes, you did. I said, Dad, you raised us in the United Pentecostal Church. Wonderful people, good people. But you and Mom were always dissidents. Dissidents on the periphery. I said, you would grow a mustache, and our pastor wouldn't let you pass the offering plate. You contended that if we couldn't have facial hair, that we had to shave off our eyebrows. Pastor even said he had never thought of that before. By the way, was that it was that you couldn't have any? Hair. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for different reasons than George Steinbrenner and the Yankees and professionalism, we just it was a sin. Was there was there some sort of Old Testament I'm sundry? I'm sure there was. Okay. I said, Dad, Mom. Mom was our organ player, best Sunday school teacher, and Aunt Larue, her sister-in-law, like a sister to her, was having migraines, and the neurologist said it was the weight of her hair that came down past her knees. And Aunt LaRue and Aunt Janice and Mom, as young women in their late 20s, studied 1 Corinthians 11 because their entire life they had been taught that a woman could not trim even the dead ends of her hair or she would lose her glory. Her submission to her head was through the uncut hair. 1 Corinthians 11, it's a plausible reading of the text. They studied, and it wasn't backsliding, it wasn't hard-heartedness, it was because of human suffering. Aunt LaRue was suffering, and they went to Brother Greer, hat in hand, humble, and said, we've studied the scripture, and we think it doesn't say what we've been told. And Mom couldn't play the organ anymore, and Aunt LaRue got taken out of her Sunday school class, 
couldn't teach children anymore, and Janice couldn't play the piano anymore. And when our pastor finally came to the house after a few months and said, Sister Shirley, if you'll just wear your cut hair up where people can't see the cut ends and repent, I'll let you back on the organ. I said, Dad, we couldn't play Little League Baseball per our church because it was a worldly amusement. You didn't agree with that, and you pushed, and you coached. We weren't supposed to have a television. You were the first family in the church to have a television. So what did he say when you're going, it's because of you? Dad. I said, you taught me how to push with integrity on matters of conscience yeah. and stay within the group even that you're pushing. And he leaned back in his chair and he said exactly what I said earlier. It's the only thing he could say. He leaned back and he said, well, we did do that. But he said, I think you've taken it too far. And I said, that's exactly what grandmother and granddad thought about you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, Stan, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, as our progressive movement grows, and, and by the way, it's only in the early stages, um, and I think even terms like progressive Christianity, evolving faith, uh, the, these are terms that will even pass away. Uh, but one of the things I'm trying to figure out from our former evangelical critics, and what I don't get is a lot of them are Calvinists and predestination. So I heard one uh, apologist saying, and this person is coming out, has written several books about it, and is very prolific in the anti-progressive movement, is talking about people like you and people like me, influencers who were leading uh, so many away from the uh, faith. And, and I think even one of these people is a, is a Calvinist, a predestination. You know, eternal security is set. So I'm, I'm trying to think, what do, they, what do they do with that theology? Like if they believe that people are predestined to heaven and people are predestined not uh, to heaven or to hell, uh, then how, how would some sort of strange movement lead people? Uh, is my thinking cockamamie on this? Well, I mean... We could really get in the weeds with reform thinking, but as one of my great reform friends explained to me, free will is only free will to the extent that you feel it as such. The experience of it is a bit Truman showish. And so all of these machinations that people are going through, ultimately, one of, sure. one of our mutual Calvinist friends here in town that pastored one of our largest reform churches, you know, I was leaning into just, how deeply he had eternal security. And this was a famous preacher in this town, great guy. And he said, Stan, I don't know. He said, I may be a wolf in sheep's clothing. I don't even know my own motives. He said, ultimately, there will be no security till I hear him say, well done. So we're all, even at the best, operating under this kind of Truman Showish again, experience that even those that supposedly are the most secure within deep reform thinking don't even know about themselves. So we have to play it out and hold ourselves accountable, knowing that ultimately God will clean it up and give clarity. That really is, I'm thinking of a really bad word right now, but it is mind-numbing. There's the cleaned-up version. That is a mind-numbing idea. Yeah. It's, again, uh, so much of the angst and the consternation about all of this is rooted. Dave, if you just keep tracing back from the leaves through the branches to the down deep subterranean to the root. What is so deeply wrong at the substrate of all of this is just the assumption of fear. The assumption that the afterlife is this bifurcated world where people are either going to live in terrible torture or they're going to live forever in utmost opulence. That kind of extremity magnified by a complete perpetuity without end, I mean, that that makes you a bit white-knuckled, nail-biting, ulcer-driven 
as you're thinking about these things. And I, I just think, you know, I, that's why I have, I suppose I work well in this, in this domain because I have such, and, and I don't want this to sound patronizing, but I do. I have such compassion for people who feel that because I bit my nails all the way out of that. There was no, there was no easy leap for me. All of this happened in gradations. It was from the United Pentecostal Church to classical Pentecostalism to more mainstream charismatic to evangelical to moderate. And then I had to start thinking about Nowen and Merton and Mother Teresa and Pope Francis and are these people going to hell? And, and, and then you start thinking about liberals like Beekner and Tillich and Niebuhr, are these people? And then you start thinking about good Jewish people and, and Hindus and Buddhists. Every one of those stages were as far as I could stretch. Now, was that a virtuous dispositional stretching led by honesty and curiosity and courage and humility and gratitude and charity? Or was that a fading of my soul and a searing of my conscience? I, I can only speak for me. There was never in any of those stretchings some enchanting sin waiting for me that I was trying to justify. I'm, I, I've been a very boring liberal. I'm like Johnny Carson. He said when he was 16, he was so innocent. He went out behind the barn and did nothing. I, I just, <laughs> it, it wasn't sin that I was trying to take advantage of. It was people that I was trying to include. And, and if, I was, if I were backsliding and searing my conscience, it was because I was trying to do for Uncle Bud and Aunt Bernice the exact same thing I did for Billy, Billy Graham. And I didn't do anything for Henry now and then I hadn't done for Billy Graham. And then I had to ask, can I do this for my Hindu friends and my Jewish friends? If, sure. the, if that kind of motivation, I guess what I'm saying is if that kind of motivation is what Satan is using to sear our conscience and damn us forever, I don't know who the God is at the source of that kind of a system. So, Stan, and not, you know, not necessarily being critical of our critics, being critical or critiquing how we once thought. Um, when you talk about this fear, uh, were you conscious of it? I mean, it's quite a narrative, and it's a good narrative that works. You have a man in a white hat, Jesus. You have a man in a black hat, Satan, the devil. And you have a damsel tied to the railroad tracks in distress, humanity. And, and both are vying and fighting for her. Um, and ultimately, right, the, the, the moral point is the man in the white hat is to win. Um, I mean, that's quite a heroic narrative. And then it's, uh, it's also a narrative of peril and fear. So, I mean, is, I don't know if I was always so conscious, c conscious of the fear aspect. Well, I, I, again, I think there is a difference. I do come from a holiness Wesleyan background that was always jeopardized in the maintaining of their salvation. Sure. So there's going to be a bit more nail biting on that side of that side of things. Of course, I mean, even on the reform side of things, as my friend, you know, he's like, I'm not sure till I get there if I'm one of the sheep. And then, you know, the whole lordship salvation thing. Well, yes, eternal security, but if you live like the devil, it's proof you never really were saved. So there was plenty of fear being spread on in all of these camps. You, as someone who was you were not inculcated with these things when you were two and three and four and five and six years old. I'm 50, I'll be 56 next month, and I still can wake up a couple of times a year in cold sweats. In my unwitting moments, theological, ecclesial dreams can haunt me to the point of waking me up and my first gasp is, oh my God, what if I'm wrong? 
those concentric rings. When I turn 56, I won't be. I, I won't cease being 55. I'll be 56 and 55 and 54. The xylem of a tree. Life goes through all of those rings, and that seven-year-old is still inside of me. That's right. And I, I just, I, I try to make sure to let every ring of the concentricity of my life come to the table. I just try to make sure the 55-year-old is the one chairing the meeting. Yeah, no, I, I... And that those wounds are still in there. And I think when Jesus said, except you become a child, he wasn't talking about some abstract child that we're all trying to become. I think he's talking about our own child. And I cannot intellectualize that five-year-old boy. When I was in second grade, Dave, I missed many days of school because of a spastic colon. When it was finally isolated for what it was, it was religious scrupulosity. A preacher had come to our church earlier that summer and did this whole thing about the afterlife and the end times and all of those scary pictures up on the wall and all of those things that as a six, seven-year-old boy, I so took them in like like a black wool sweater and lint in the air. I just, I was Velcro. And it, so much personality involved. My brother was sitting beside me and he was Teflon. Great guy. It just rolled off him. I took it all in and it gave me a spastic colon because I was worried about getting off the bus and mom not being there because that meant the rapture took place. And I was, mm-hmm. That's a six-year-old child wow. carrying that kind yeah. of trauma. It's a lot of trauma. And it is uh, a trauma, uh, that kind of anxiety. You know, I mean, growing up Catholic, we had our own uh, sense of fear as well. There was venial sin. There was mortal sin. Uh, you know, Christ was most mostly illustrated and depicted still on the cross. I can remember our uh, St. Peter's Church in my town of Lewiston, New York, the old one before they built the super hit 1970s version. But the Jesus on that cross was, uh, it had to be a 8-foot, 10-foot figure, uh, fully lifelike, illustrated blood. And I remember just being captivated by that. And then when they built the super hip, cool 1970s church, that was all uh, modernized. So we had our our sense of fear. But Stan, when I converted to really evangelicalism versus I became a Christian, I don't wor- give that wording anymore. When I converted to evangelicalism, Mine was very much what was coming of age, the, you know, the super hip, cool American Christianity. It was a leftover from the Jesus movement. Uh, it was very much the hip, cool churches. I was a hip, cool campus crusade kid at USC. And then I came up through the whole church growth movement uh, of the 90s and 2000s, which were the black box churches, fog machine worship, you know, uh, you know what became. You know, uh, I worked at Willow, so from the Bill Hybels uh, version of church growth all the way, of course, to then the Andy Stanleys and Craig Rochelles, and to what it's now. So I, so I have a feeling, uh, like where you say you, you you feel for it or feel for those people, which I totally get. It's your heritage. Mine is a sense of, um, like, damn it, I, I was duped. Um, because I view my conversion now not as, you know, the old testimony. I view my conversion as really a psychological need. My parents' marriage had blown apart. I was the youngest of four. Um, uh, My grandfather, who was the patriarch of our family, had recently passed. My parents' divorce was hard and bitter and hurtful. And so I was at a very much a relational need. And one thing evangelicals do well to their complement that if you wear the team colors and join the team, they will love you. And so my heart was, so then I left New York, uh, got to USC in Los Angeles, 
and got involved with young, fun, great, loving, cool kids. But my process now in looking back, uh, I have to go through a different kind of of hurt. Uh, well, let me serve as the interviewer for a moment because I, something does intrigue me about what you just said. You felt duped. Okay, my interpretation of duped is that there is this vulnerable human, you, and there is this malevolent, ill-motivated person who really doesn't believe all of this stuff, who is intentionally deceiving you. Mm. That's, that's not it. That's not what you're talking no, about. No, yeah. It's not then a mal- you? It's not a, the duping is the idea. Okay, so we're not angry at people. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I, I've had to work through my own. I, it was easy for me to untangle the people because I had myself as an example. I knew how sincere I was when I was believing those yes. things, and it's not hard for me to give what Brene Brown calls the generous assumption or the benefit of the doubt. We called it. I I just don't remember a bunch of hypocrites trying to deceive me. I remember really good people with really limited ideas probably doing the best they could today. And I don't want to take away their capacity for change and be, you know, take that away from them. I just, I don't. But I, don't, I, I can't look back and remember any raging hypocrites. I remember good people doing the best they could with the information they had. And I feel incredibly yeah. grateful that somehow I, I got out. Yeah, and and no, this, your point is is well said, and not only well received. It's it's what I experienced. I didn't. So when I say I feel duped, excuse me, it's not. There was no person going, ha ha. We know this is BS, and right. we're going to fool this young kid, uh, college kid. No, 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 no. These were people that were convinced as well where i say i feel duped and maybe duped is not the right word i don't know if i have a right one but it's just that i remember i said what i what i think um what what is it our old evangelical community is missing from part of the deconstruction uh, they tend to double down on the theology, let alone look at it. I look at some of those theological, doctrinal things I believed then. And I go, I don't believe them now. I did not have a family that raised me in those, even a even a, a Catholic family didn't raise me in some of those. So now the duping was, how could my young mind, my young intelligence, even my young connection to God, because back to conversion, I always felt an existential kinetic connection to God. Even laying in my bed as a six, seven-year-old, I would ponder existential questions that I didn't even know were existential. Who am I in the universe? What does this all mean? Is there something I pondered, which is very human. Um, So I don't look back and go, I regret having a spiritual relationship with God. I don't even have a regret over using Christian spirituality as my vehicle to that. I have no regret from six to my age now. The regrets are that I was part of a version of Christianity that I was told by people is the truth. Now, they believed it sincerely and still do, but I can still have some angst over that I, I think i think we can i the tension between owning the wounding and yet not having to go to the jugular of ill intent and motive 
the capacity to look and say that was not good. But I wasn't some ultimate victim to a malevolent group of people. Nor was I. I. No. When we lift out of this conversation from the immediacy of our connection to our people, this world, this time, and we back up to 30 to, 30 to 40,000 feet and look at religion writ large, human spirituality writ large, the different variations of religion, is a very biological, ecological, anthropological, sociological, psychological, there is a framework for all of this, for our species, as an evolutionary part of biological life. We are a species, an animal species, that has to wrestle with whatever level of consciousness we have. We have to wrestle with things like fear of scarcity and, and what scarcity might mean. It might mean that my neighbors are competitors. It m might mean that my, my family become enemies because we're vying for what we have assumed is a limited resource. I think if there is a gospel, the gospel is probably that there's enough because I think the underlying assumption that drives so much of what we do, because I even think religious exclusivism is a type of competition born out of a fear of scarcity. Sure. The elder brother didn't look at the father and say, you shouldn't have thrown a party for the younger brother. He never said the father shouldn't have done that. His complaint was the party had never been thrown for him. And, and we just assume that he's mad about this. I think most of us, isn't this why this is somewhat psycho-spiritual? It's Absolutely. not just, we have a, I mean, part of the story of the prodigal son is a psychological one as well. Ab absolutely. It's a journey home to it. He came to himself. He didn't come to God because God's never left. He came to himself. That's right. And it was Henry Nouwen saying that he finally heard the voice of the father say, come home. And, and he said, I said, where is home? And the father said, your heart. And Henry said, I can't live there. I mean, this was a running gay priest trying to get away from so much. And he said, the father gently spoke to him and said, Henry. I'm God. I live here. If I can live here, you can too. If, if there is a salvation, it's this, it's not this linear journey to become somebody we're not. It's this circular journey to come home to who we always have been. I agree. Yeah. And, but in that journeying as a, as a biological species, we have reason to fear a sense of scarcity. Our, our lack of access to resources. And when that happens, we get incredibly competitive to one another. And, and religious exclusivism is just scarcity that God's heart might not be wide enough for all of us. I mean, even the Revelator's vision of heaven, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Well, it sounds expansive, but when you start thinking about 8 billion people, I don't know that we can all fit in there. Yeah. And so, right. you know, Jehovah's Witness doubled down on 144,000, and we get very numerical about this because there's always a sense of limiting. So religious exclusivism is, is just trying to divide up God's heart and make sure there's room for us. And, and heaven, we're just all kind of deed claiming our spot there because there may not be enough. What if the gospel is there's enough? What if the good news is? I mean, that's what we, that's what we know even... In this world, there's enough. The world's not starving for food that doesn't ex exist. It's starving for food that we put down our garbage disposal. It's distribution, not it's lack of access. And that lack of access, I don't believe the lack of access is driven by hatred as much as it's driven by fear. I don't think the elder brother really hates the younger brother as much as he's never felt the party of grace for himself. If he could have ever felt it for himself, he would have been thrilled that his brother could experience it. And isn't that, uh, uh, isn't that also Genesis 1? In our evangelical days, we were told that, that the fall, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, uh, was the pride of humanity, where I just, that, that's the story of the fear of humanity. That's, that's, um, 
And of course, uh, you and I don't believe that's a, uh, uh, a literal story. It's part of our ancient origin story to tell us, for us to find where we're at. But even that story is a story of two human individuals uh, in fear of, of their place uh, in the world, with God, with each other. Um, so Stan, I take it from listening to you. Uh, so where are you at on heaven and hell these days? I, I love life so much, I don't want it to end. And what part of that is personality, what part of that is some intuitive spiritual longing, I don't know. I just know I love life, and I would love for it to go on. I also have no sense of certainty or deep conviction about that. Of an uh, afterlife, you mean? Yes. I'm looking over your shoulder. I saw A.J. Levine, AJ Levine's name up there. Years ago, I was in a class with A.J., and A.J. brought in one of her friends, a guy named Gerd Ludman, who's an eminent New Testament theologian. Gerd deconstructed his way beyond Christianity as a New Testament academic, beyond being an evangelical biblicist, Christian, theist. Gerd finally deconstructed all the way down to just kind of a raw corporeal humanism. Great guy, great mind. But AJ is still a wistful believer, you know, in, in spirituality and the divine, just as I am. She does in Judaism what I do with Christianity. And Gerd was there as a friend to her, but he kind of cast a friendly aspersion toward her and people like me. And he said, well, AJ, as a religionist, is a sentimentalist. Because that's really what liberal progressive theologies of any faith discipline are. Any religious discipline finally creates this liberal progressive iteration that sentimentally and nostalgically cannot let go of Santa Claus, so allegorizes and metaphor metaphorizes the whole thing just because it can't let go. And he said so much of all of that is just rabid sentimentalism. And it's, it, it's kind of like a, a methadone clinic. It's a step-down unit. You're moving. It's a halfway house back into real life. And from Gerd's perspective, that's letting go of all the silliness and the mythology. AJ said, she said, Gerd, you absolutely could be right. And she meant that. She said, I don't know anymore. The invisible world, God, the afterlife, I have no sense of knowing, no sense of certainty. She said, but in the absence of certainty and knowing, she said, I do believe. But she said, I have to admit, the more I study and the more I go into prisons and the more I see human suffering, she said, there are times that the belief meter falls beneath 50%, it dips down sometime in the teens and single digits. And she said, it's not right to call it belief at that point. But she said, in the absence of belief, she said, I still hope. I hope that there's some sense of meaning that we're going, people who've lost small children are going to see them again. I hope that there's a world where lions will lie down with lambs. And But she said, I do have to admit I've listened to you enough and others like you. Sometimes even the hope drains out of the bottom of my feet. But she said, in my unwitting hours when I dream, these better thoughts have never left my dreams. And she said, Gerd, for me, religion is no longer about knowing and even believing. It's about hopes and dreams. And in the end, I think these are the only hopes and dreams worth dreaming. Those are the things that now run goosebumps down my arm, and I think, I don't know, that sounded like a middle C, and maybe it's not, but something. Right now I can feel it. It's like humming in me. It's like, yeah. yes. Spirituality for me is not synonymous with theism or religious expression. Spirituality is an intuitive concern about and reflection on matters of ultimate meaning. Where did this come from? Where is it going? 
as I sit with my my mom, who's somewhere between two years old and 77 now, in her 13th year of dementia, and I held her hand and we sang about heaven yesterday, I didn't feel like I was leading her astray or being led astray by her. I, I feel like it's not less than all of those things I once believed. I think it's probably more than all of them. And that kind of reflection about somewhere between where we came from, where this is going, is there any meaning there? Is there any morality? Is there anything or anyone to whom we're responsible? I don't know. That those, those kind of sentiments and feelings don't lead me toward positions of theology. They lead me toward dispositions of soul, like curiosity and courage and humility and gratitude. And it just feels like the Sermon on the Mount, even from Jesus, was more dispositional than it was positional. And I don't, I don't even feel a need to evangelize that or fix my conservative friends. Nobody fixed me. I don't, I, I, I don't want to be the new liberal who's just as evangelical and fundamentalist as I, I used to be. I don't want to swap one certainty for another. I, I haven't really moved. My biggest move isn't from theological positions about providence and substitutionary penal atonement to other theological positions as much as it's just kind of a wistful, peaceful, difficult, and yet relieving letting go of certainty. And that, for me, nobody did that for me. That was a journey, and I'm so willing to let other people take their journey. I sat with a young couple this morning that I'm marrying in May, and one of them is still deeply religious and spiritual, and the other has been so hurt. It was a lesbian couple. Been so hurt. And I, I felt no need or obligation or capacity to change either of them. I looked at two human beings that were good, and I thought they're on their journey I don't feel ahead of them, behind them, over them. I just feel with them. Yeah. It's just a different deal these days for me. And when I hear people, you know, talk about me and you know, some of our mutual friends we've even talked about, and I'm I'm like a poster child for I don't look at that and recoil and have ill feelings. I I, just, I don't I don't feel a need to fix that. I, I did that to people. I don't want to do it back to them. I am so satisfied. I've seen enough in these 55 years to know they're on their journey. I don't know the I don't know all of the complex pieces that make the algorithm of their present judgment. I just know I've had them and time. I can't remember if it was Oliver Wendell Holmes or Ralph Waldo Emerson. I think it's attributed to both, but the mind once exposed to a better idea can never shrink to its original dimensions. But even more than that, Andrew Sue, and I don't know who Andrew Sue is, but he said something so profound. He said, a widened heart sees others with hope and possibility as, to, as opposed to seeing them through the lens of a severe, loveless accuracy. I remember the move from conservative theology to liberal theology. It was a widening of mind, but... That does not necessarily mean a widening of heart. I have a lot of really hateful liberal friends, and I'm like, I, I'm glad your mind has widened, but how about the heart? And I, I think better ideas stretch the mind, but experiences of human suffering and just the empathy of being with people widens and wallows and hollows out a capacity of heart that I think is more about this than than the mind part. Well, first let me say that's uh, that's beautifully put. And uh, and partly what's and what's wrong with sentimentality that that can be a virtue as well. Um And I think in listening to you, uh, what you're preserving is the human soul, spiritual soul connection. I think what I partly worry about uh, the former life I had or we had 
was we were so steeped in um, cataphatic theology that theology was very explainable. Thus, we get Christian apologetics. And what you're talking about is an apophatic theological experience. There's a soul. There is something ineffable, something unexplainable that is connected to our soul. And I heard one apologist say to another, do you think the people who have gone through a deconstruction, do you think they were ever Christians at all? And I think of what you just shared, which is also my experience. I am just so connected uh, to this this God uh, that has been part of my whole life, that when someone even goes, maybe I was never really a, it's just heart boggling, mind boggling uh, to me when someone says that my, my shift, my evolution, my awakening, even my shift away from a certain version, I lost something. I feel I've gain something, but to your point, not in an intellectual um, or even an emotional experiential betterism. I'm better now. No, 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 no. Because there's an arrogance in that. It's like it, I've experienced a deeper knowing, a deeper connection, uh, not to sound too sappy, my my love between who I am as a human and to the God the best I can connect to is only deepened. So then when I hear someone tritely say, yeah, maybe there wasn't a real love there at all, I just want to go, what are you talking about? My love feels stronger and greater than ever. And just listening to you, uh, recall that or your experience from the AJ story. Uh, it just, it brings that to mind and heart for me. Beekner in the alphabet of grace said, so here I am a 43 year old taxpayer, US citizen, father of three. And he said, for whatever reason, I continue to reach my hand into the dark. I've never had what I would consider a self-authenticating religious experience, at least to the extent that I could prove to another person the existence of God, or even to myself the existence of God. He said, perhaps the thing that I believe most by is that, for whatever reason, I can't keep from reaching my hand into that dark. And I would add to that, I have never felt the full embrace of the divine hand. I, I grew up speaking in tongues, running the aisles, feeling the goosebumps. But in looking back, I don't know that I have anything that has left me with such utter certainty. But from time to time, I swear I feel the brushing of fingertips. In another place... Beekner said, I've never had the malevolent or the beatific vision of Milton's paradise lost, but from time to time I swear I hear whispers from the wings of the stage. And the kind of peacefulness that comes with that, it's, um, it leaves me, it leaves my heart, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly magnanimous here, it just leaves my heart softened even toward those who would question my experience. Their, their questioning of my experience, I did the same thing. And I remember where it was rooted. I, I have been that elder brother examining and unwilling to go to other parties, but I know where it came from for me. I mean, that whole story started with Jesus was sitting with a group of people he considered friends. And religious authorities walked up on that scene. That's the way Luke 15 starts. And the religious authorities looked at Jesus. I mean, if there's anything that kind of 
positions me where I feel in Christianity and the work that I do now to 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 be an articulate representation or presentation of what I'm trying to do is that scene. Jesus is with his friends. Religious authorities don't approve of those friends. They walk up to Jesus and they essentially say, if you're an emissary of God, I mean, a holy God separates from sin, right? You can't commiserate like this. And Jesus, with great compassion, said, can I tell you a story? And he turned his attention from his friends, who the religious leaders believe were a motley crew of sinners, but that's not the way Jesus saw them. Jesus, they were his friends. Jesus was a friend of sinners, not a friend to sinners. I mean, I guess God would be a friend to sinners, but that's not the big deal. He was a friend of sinners. That means when these people were talking about their friends, they mentioned Jesus. That God would be comfortable with sinners, sure, it's God. That sinners would be comfortable with Jesus, that tells you a lot more about Jesus. They're like, yeah, this guy named Jesus. Jesus said, well, I'll tell you three stories, actually. Woman with 10 coins, loses one, leaves the nine, goes and looking for it, goes, looks for it. Heaven rejoices when she finds it. Numbers change. Shepherd has 100 sheep. 99 are safe. One's lost. He goes looking for the lost one. To make it really simple, he said a man had two sons. And he sets them up, not, not to make fools of them, but to open their hearts and minds. He sets them up because... The woman goes looking for the lost coin. The shepherd goes looking for the lost sheep. And here's a son that takes everything and goes to the far country. And he's obviously the lost one. And the religious leaders are getting it because Jesus is setting them up that these people he's with are the lost ones that he's out looking for. But the story finally culminates. The father never goes looking for the kid that went to the far country. He even financed the trip. The son makes his circular journey, comes home. The father celebrates him, and the father says somebody's missing. And he goes looking for the lost son. The lost son was the elder brother. Jesus didn't look at the religious leaders and say, you know what, I'm going to reverse this whole deal. You've always been the gatekeepers. You thought you were going to heaven. Now you're going to be left out and they're going to go to heaven. He didn't say that. He said, these people that you have left out, they're going to enter the kingdom ahead of you. So all of my friends that are self-righteously maybe judging me, I don't think I'm going to get there and they're not just because they think they're going to get there and I'm not. It's not, it's not like tit for tat. Jesus said, these folk you don't think are going to get there, they're going to enter the kingdom ahead of you. You're going to get there but religious sin, smugness, the insecurity that demands certainty, all of that stuff is just harder for the soul to sort through than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But you'll finally get there. It'll just take you longer. So everybody gets in. And there's not this reversal now that the conservatives are out, now the liberal. No, everybody gets in. I think it was, um, gosh, I can't remember which book I read it in, but somebody was telling about a wonderful portrait they saw of this staircase leading up like Jacob's staircase to heaven. And at the top, there's angels and there's all of these vagabonds dancing. And it's obviously just the hoi polloi of earth that has made their way. Some of them are just even streaming up the stairs into heaven. And they obviously look like all the people we wouldn't have thought would make it to heaven. And at the bottom of the stairs are religious people, obviously religious people with arms folded, looking with disdain at who's dancing up the staircase and the celebration in heaven. And one thing you notice is that Jesus isn't at the top of the stairs dancing with the angels and the hoi polloi. He's at the bottom of the stairs looking gently to the religious conservative authorities and inviting them. They just couldn't imagine getting on that same staircase. It just takes them longer. And I don't think that's hatred as much as it's insecurity. No, I, I agree. And um, I do too. I, I, I think we all get there. Um, uh, I have no need to 
tell my former evangelical brothers and sisters they're wrong. I, I, of course, I have to endure a lot that I am. Uh, but man, if that's how they're on um, journeying. Um, well, I don't want you to ever hear me saying that I think all of that's fine. I think fear-based ideas about God, life, and the afterlife are, are, are the greatest wounding of our species. And I do believe they are appendixes and wisdom teeth that we are evolving out of. And I think they have damaged me. I see them damaging people. I want those ideas evolved out of. The people who are in that evolutionary process, I, I, I want to push them while also being compassionate to just how difficult that process has been for many of us. It is a difficult thing to let go of for a lot of people, a lot of personalities, a lot of backgrounds. So, no, the ideas are damnable. Yeah, and I, and I know you well enough to know that exactly the ideas, but your heart and love for people uh, is evident. So much so, I think where I want to turn this to, Stan, is you have become quite, because of all the things we've been talking about, and uh, you've become quite an activist and an advocate um, within Christendom for the LGBTQIA plus community. And I know your experience, but I'd like you to comment on it. All this humanness, all this love, all this marginal marginalizing of people, bad ideas, bad theology, they hurt people. Yet to tell someone that we know is connected to God, uh, one is God's child, but is actually having a spiritual experience with God that they are not, um, is part of the wounding. So tell us about some of that just the day-to-day -day conversations you have, the week-to-week -week conversations for the past number of years uh, with wonderful gay Christians uh, here in the States, around the world, and, and everything from the wounding to the hope that you're seeing. I um, was just at a Baptist church in Athens, Georgia this past weekend, Millage Avenue Baptist Church, formerly Southern Baptist Church that has made its way to full inclusion for LGBTQ people. And it's an SBC church? Came out of the SBC, was planted by an SBC church, and um, now would be a co-op Baptist, but well-heeled Baptist people that have made their way to full inclusion. I sat there Sunday in that service and Afterwards, we had a, a, a time of soup, and then we came back in for a panel discussion. I sat beside a pastor who happens to be a lesbian. This PhD Baptist pastor of the congregation. It was just lovely, and there was so much hope. And I sat with the young people in the in in the youth class before even service, and just listening to them talk. There, there's so many. There's so many uh, reasons to have hope in all of this. I've also done 25 funerals in the last 40, 42 months for LGBTQIA people who died at the intersection, the train wreck of their gender sexuality with their faith. And the church was incredibly complicit in that process. You're speaking, were those mostly suicides? All. All suicides. Yeah, talk about the pain. The scripture I used Sunday was John 9. It's such a, it's such a picture of this entire story. It's one of the reasons I think our, our text really is sacred. It's, it's not because... Adam and Eve is the story of two historical people. It's because 
it's more brilliant than that. It's the story of every human being who's ever lived. I mean, who takes scripture more seriously? The one that's trying to isolate two people in history or the one that says, no, my God, I'm reading a 4,000 year old story and it's making me quake inside because it's me. I'm Joseph in the well. I'm Jacob wrestling with God. I'm Jesus in Gethsemane. I'm the one that the Spirit falls on and says, you're my beloved son. It's our story. I'm the father, the younger son, and the elder in the story. Yes. It's brilliant. That's right. Jesus is walking down the road, and John 9 says he saw a person. I, just, I love that simple language. He saw a person even before who was blind. He saw a person. It makes me think of the time he was in Simon's house and and he's there with the religious leaders and the woman who was considered a sinner in town walks in, falls down at his feet and just weeps. And the juxtaposition, I mean the feng shui of the humans in that room were the religious guys were looking at her thinking, what kind of a weird fetish is this? Where has she met Jesus before? The sinner from the city down doing something to his feet. They're watching her. She's enthralled with Jesus, and Jesus is watching them. And he looks at Simon and says, Simon, why do you think these things in your heart? And then he asked them the question. He said, have you seen this woman? Do you see this woman? Mm -hmm. John 9 says that he saw a person, not a problem, not a dilemma, he saw a person, and immediately, Dave, those closest to him, I mean, what a picture, those closest to him, his closest followers, the immediate disciples, within arm's reach of this suffering human, they look at Jesus and say, you know, this begs a question. I mean, it's like the Armenian reform debate. This begs a question. We know that he's here because of sin. Human suffering is the result of sin. We both sides, Catholic, Protestant, there are some things we agree on. Armenian, you know, Wesleyan, uh, Reform, we, we agree on some things. He's here because of sin. Kind of the nuanced question facing us today in refined theology is, can that be generational or does it have to come directly from him? Did he sin or did his parents sin? Eugene Peterson brilliant, and I know it's more commentary than translation, but I think God Almighty, when he heard how Peterson translated that text, said, wish I would have thought of that. That's exactly right. Peterson said that Jesus looked at them and said, you're asking the wrong question. I think immature or maturing religion is still trying to come up with right answers to wrong questions. It's like, oh my God. It's like, Jesus, like, I can't even, we, we can't even bridge to one another because you're, you're thinking yourself erudite and profound and you're looking to me to give some sage answer. How do I give a sage answer to an inane question? That's right. And he turns away from his closest followers and he just heals the guy. He doesn't take him to church. He doesn't talk theology with him. He just heals him, and the guy goes about his business. And immediately the religious organization, this is not about Judaism and Christianity. It's about what humans can do with, with all of this stuff, with power, with God, with human need. It's, the religious authorities heard what had happened. They, they called the guy in. I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking about LGBTQ people. They called the guy in and they needed him to disavow his experience with the divine because it didn't happen under their purview. That's right. It didn't happen the right way. And the guy is seeing for the first time in his life, he had to sit there and hear the people close it. Before the religious leaders got in, the people closest to Jesus, even these sincere disciples of Jesus, are talking about him in the third person. He's like, guys, I, I can't see, but I can hear. You're talking about me, all my suffering, all my pain, and I'm a theological problem for you? I mean, think about the picture. Jesus is seeing a person, and they see a theological problem. 
and he heals the guy, doesn't even broach their theological problem, and then the religious leaders get a hold of the guy and say, because it didn't happen here and didn't happen our way, and you do not, we need you. I don't care that you can see. You need to disavow your experience of the divine. And the guy said that he couldn't. Think about LGBTQ people. They then called his parents in, said you need to get a hold of your child. And the worst part of the story, I don't know what's the worst part of the story, but arguably the worst part of the story for me, and this is what I face with LGBTQ kids every day, worst part of the story is when the parents who had, I mean, they held him when he was born. His mom, when he was a few weeks old, told his dad something's not right. He's not, they watched this little guy. His dad laved him out his first walking stick. They took him to the side of the road every day. They knew his suffering. And now he can see. And the religious leaders put such pressure on them to get in control of their son. The worst parenthetical in the whole story is that his parents equivocated and would not stand up for their son. And they said, you just need to ask, talk to him. We're not responsible. And the parenthetical is because they were afraid they would get put out of their religious group. The insult to the injury to these kids is all of the stupid stuff Jesus' closest followers say about them. The insult to the injury of the religious leaders trying to get them to disavow their experience and kick them out is that sometimes their own parents won't stand up for them because they're afraid they would get put out. They call the guy back in, and the guy says, I can't even, I don't know how to argue with you. I don't know anything about theology. I just know I can see. And maybe I can't come here and sing your songs and do your liturgies and all of that, but I'm going to go watch sunrises and sunsets and inchworms on leaves, and and I'm going to distinguish between fuchsias and periwinkles, and I'm just going to use these eyes. And I think the loveliest part of the story is that when the guy leaves, he doesn't have his mom and dad, he doesn't have a church to celebrate with him, but he leaves with his eyes, and the Bible says when Jesus heard what happened, he turned around and went and found the guy. And what's hard for me is that Jesus didn't say, you know what, let's go back to the synagogue, let's work things out. Jesus looked at him and said, you're okay, we're okay. If you never go back there, I mean, that's that is that's a two thousand year old story, and it's as contemporary, and it it is multiply that times ten every day for me. Those are the private messages I wow. get, and when I tell them that story, plus or minus three percent, they cry and they say, "That's my life." That's right. Now you take a two thousand year old story, and it's so relevant uh, today, and it's one of my favorite. Uh, New Testament stories. I love teaching it at our congregation the same way. Almost as if Jesus, when they're debating, uh, is he naughty heretical? Is he naughty because he's naughty? Is he punished because he's naughty? It's as if Jesus is going, what are you freaking talking about? It has nothing to do with that. I love that story. And then, of course, as you as you recall, the incredible humility uh, humiliation he continues to have to go through as our gay brothers and sisters trans brothers and sisters have experienced and uh you know i i know you know that i i made a, a little film part of my graduate thesis uh talking about um the suicide tragedy amongst gay people lgbtq people uh r- religiously uh instigated And then uh, a part of that little docu I made is, to your point, um, that when a a gay, bi, or trans kid kid is from a religious home and then gets parental and religious rejection from their mom and dad, the jeopardy and the actual life jeopardy that that puts that kid in and you're telling me you did how many funerals in 42 months i think the number is 25 and were they all family rejected as well to some degree 
Yeah, to varying degrees. I I did one probably a year ago where I went to southern Idaho and I thought I was going to go to the service with the family, but the mother couldn't go. 26-year-old son, gay, came out in his early 20s after years of torture sitting quietly in a church, best kid in their family, best kid in the youth group, fourth year medical student, just the grind of medical school and residency. I mean, the the algorithm of suicide is always more than one variable, but the centerpiece was the devastation of always feeling himself insufficient and out of step with God because of the way he was naturally created that he could never embrace. I didn't go to the service because the mom decided not to go to the service because she didn't want to be around 500 people that had been a part of the church that had reinforced this. And I sat with her all day long looking through old pictures and trying to piece together. It's every, every story is different, but it's so unnecessary. It's to, I mean, the the bottom line is, you and I, just to be really clear, we deeply believe that this sexual binary, that there is heterosexual and homosexual, and heterosexual is the only thing blessed by God, I disagree with that. I I just, I believed, I, I deeply believe same gender, romantic, sexual, intimate love is as celebrated by God as its heterosexual counterpart. I just want to be clear about that. This is not something that's some broken part of our genome or something that God has to tolerate. It, it is and, well said. And well I said. just, you know, I I think again, it is a very psychosocial thing that we do. Human beings. We all carry a sense of insufficiency in our psyche, in our soul. This haunting fear that we're not enough. This haunting fear. And I don't know that that starts prenatal, natal. I don't know how sociologically driven. I mean, there's arguments about that. I just know most of us, by the time we hit kindergarten, we are wrestling with a sense of are we good enough, fast enough, smart enough, big enough, pretty enough. And I I think that sense of insufficiency, I would call shame, a sense of not enoughness, roots down, because as a wiser man than I said, we don't have a soul, we are a soul. Our bodies are soulish. And I think it gets in a sort of physical level. And I think I, I think the story you just alluded to, the garden story, they saw the fruit with their eyes, picked it with their hands, ate it with their mouth, digested it with their belly, and yet when the sense of shame and embarrassment hit them, what did they cover? Their loins. They hadn't even sinned sexually. It's interesting. They were made in the image of God, and that was described in Genesis 2 as naked and not ashamed. Isn't it amazing that the pristine soul was not described as naked and sinless? It was described as naked and not ashamed. Yes. Shame was the primary issue. That's right. Which is tethered to fear, what we were fear. talking Yeah. The serpent didn't come to Eve and tempt her first to sin. He tempted her to shame. How? He said, what did God say to you, that's three things. There's God, there's you, and there's a communication between. Before he ever got to the tree, he was talking about her and God and the relationship they had. And he just picked the tree out and said, what do you say about that? She said, well, he told me not to eat it or I would die. And the serpent says, and he tells her, you've been lied to. In other words, he's not first and primarily saying the tree is so great you need to try it. He's saying what I need you to understand is you don't have the relationship with God you thought you had. You're getting shortchanged. You are being lied to. Now what's interesting is her jump was not to believe that means God is bad. She believes she must be someone worth lying to because she still wanted to be like God And the serpent even baited her and said, but if you'll eat of that tree, you'll be like God. So the first sin was her stealing something that she already possessed by gift. She was made in the likeness of God, 
but now she's told you're really not and you don't have the relationship with God. You're only worth lying to. But if you'll eat of that tree, you'll be like God. And she didn't say, well, I don't want to be like God. He's a liar. She said, I want to be better. And then he won't lie to me. He won't hit me. He won't hurt me. I deserve this. The fall of humanity in Genesis 3 was not a fall into sin. It was first to fall into shame and not enoughness. That's what it is. I was just going to say, it's not. A, it's the feeling of not being enough. Not even, it, it certainly is that you have a God who's lying to you. Your experience is that you are not enough. And I don't deserve the truth. That's right. I, I deserve this. And that kind of, when that was when that was felt in their bodies they felt it where we have the most nerve endings per square millimeter not just physiologically but psychologically if, if the insecurities of my soul play out in my body nowhere do they play out more tenderly and intimately than in this part of me that is so wired for connection so wired with longing it's such an it's a it's almost a caricature, or maybe better said, a sacrament of the rest of my body. And you just feel things so intensely there. And you wonder, am I good enough? And even when you're with a partner, was it good for you? Is it, is it, am I enough? Am I as good as who you've been with before? And will this always be enough? Will you always want me? And all of that. That's not dirty, naughty stuff. That's the stuff of soul and sufficiency. And I think the reality is, we all carry that so intensely in our souls and our bodies and in our sexual parts that sometimes the intensity of that weight, C.S. Lewis called it the weight of glory, the intensity of that weight crushes us and under the weight of that crushing intensity, our insufficiency rages so high that we do something that psychosocially humans are prone to do. We find a group, a minority, someone different enough from us that we can distinguish them and the distinguishing them, we can call them bad. And we act like we are laying our hands on them and telling them to run off with their sin. What we're actually doing is scapegoating them, heaping our shame onto them and saying, take my shame away from me. Because we have all gone so many places in our heads and our hearts with sexuality that we can't bear it and we cover our loins and we haven't even sinned there. And we just treat them the way we cannot bear to continually treat ourselves. I think what we have done to the queer community is just a projection of what we have done to ourselves and can't bear it. And I think the Genesis story is a beautiful story because it's not a story of sin, separation, sacrifice, and salvation. It's not they sinned, God's holy, God can't be with them, animal skins have to cover them, and somehow through that sacrifice there's propitiation and they're saved. I know that I know that we've interpreted that way. I get that we've interpreted that way. But if you really read the story, Dave, they sinned and God still came. It wasn't sin and separation. God came, probably got there 30 minutes earlier and said, where are you? And they said, we're hiding. He said, why are you hiding? They said, we're naked. And God doesn't say, "You well, you better hide then. God said, who told you? Yeah. Who told you you were naked? Who told you that you weren't good enough to be with me? Not only was there not separation, there was proximity. God came to them and they come out with their fig leaves and God tenderly takes the fig leaves off. And they turn red, not because of the scathing fire of God's judgment, but the internal sense of shame flushes their faces. And God sees them there. And God takes animal skins. Somebody tell me, does it look like they are taking skins to cover themselves so God can be comfortable in the presence of their sin? Or is God covering their shame so they can be comfortable in the presence of divine love? It's not sin, separation, sacrifice, and salvation. It's shame, love, and healing through proximity. And no longer is God defined as one who is so holy that he can't be near sin. He is one that is so holy, he can be no place other than that sin. And if Jesus is, for Christians, the emblem of God, how 
is Jesus so near? Because it's the only place love could ever be. What parent would, how could we ever laud ourselves, Dave, if we say, I am such a great parent when my child was most broken, I had to be the farthest for them because I'm too holy. It's, our story is shame. And I think all of that to say, and I, I think there are so many issues there, but all of that to say, that's what we've done to the queer community. Yeah. We have heaped our shame on them and we shouldn't even have borne of the shame. We, le- we need, I mean, salvation is not going back to the sinless place. It's going back to naked and not ashamed. And I think, Stan, as you, uh, and obviously we're specifically trying to emphasize love for our queer community, but you also tell a broader story. I really, I really think, and I hold to that interpretation of Genesis as well, uh, and, it's, and, and then it is sort of tethered to the prodigal story as well, in the sense that is the gospel. That's the gospel versus a penal substitution. You know what's crazy is even the temptation of Jesus that Luke and Matthew gives us. Jesus wasn't tempted to sin. Turning bread into stone, he did, he did, or stone into bread, he did stuff like that all the time. He was wet with the waters of his baptism, hearing, you are my beloved son, in whom, not by whom, in whom, intrinsically. I mean, that's the, that's the picture of all humanity. Right. And immediately he's driven into the wilderness, and the first thing he hears is not hungry, want some bread, look at that fruit, pick the fruit. First thing he hears is, if you are the beloved son of God. Prove it. Justify your belovedness by pulling a rabbit out of a hat. That is not a temptation to sin. That is a temptation of identity. That is a temptation of shame and insufficiency, sufficiency. So even the temptation of Jesus was not first to sin. It was a temptation to question intrinsic identity. I mean, our story, if it's just read properly, it's all there. I agree. No, I, and you know, Stan, as I, as I listen to you, um, and again, this is just my uh, experience, but here's the irony when I was an evangelical. Of course, I was told I was a sinner saved by God's love through grace. Um, and that I couldn't earn it. I was enough, meaning that's what was told to me at my born again salvation story. But then my, using old language now, uh, it's not language I use anymore, but then my discipleship story, my journey then as a Christian was only feeling like I'm not enough. Right. Um, and that was the, that was part of the, that was one of the things in my shifting away from evangelicalism going, it seems to me that the God, this, this rigid versionistic theology only continues to heap upon me, I'm not enough or my friends aren't enough, or the gay community, the gay people I love aren't enough. It was either the theology I was experiencing or the one I was supposed to preach called the truth. And I just, I, it just... I think when, I, when you look at Eve, she's being told that she is separated from God that they don't have the relationship she thought they had. So she's being told a lie of separation. And then she's being promised a cure of restoration. And it's leaving her with this residual inadequacy. But the whole thing began when she was told she had a sickness she didn't have, 
offered a cure she didn't need and left with an illness she didn't deserve. And I think that's what Christianity has the capacity to continue maturing out of. I do, do I think first century Christianity taught that? I, I, I'm really not one of those liberals that was like, substitutionary penal atonement didn't come along until the 11th century and answer. No, I think Paul was a substitutionary penal atonement guy. I do, I don't mind that a bit. I think Paul was brilliant in first century, in, in a first century church. I think Ptolemy was a brilliant pre-Christ astronomer. I don't think he saw through the same lens Neil deGrasse Tyson does, but I think he looked in the same direction with the limits of, of, of the telescopes he had at the time. I think Paul was a brilliant progressive. I just don't believe the first century church was the archetype. I think it was the infant. And it never had to be the archetype. And I think what we're looking for in the Judeo-Christian text is not a fixed point on the development of the idea on the y-axis. I think we're looking for the slope that we can extrapolate as we continue to move along the x-axis of time and the slope of Jesus. That's why Paul, 20 years after Jesus, when he was asked, can a woman divorce a pagan husband? There's probably abuse going on. Paul knew what Jesus had said through oral tradition about there had to be pornia, there had to be sexual morality. He knew how he had answered that question from the Pharisees and the disciples. And 20 years later, he said, I have no word from the Lord on this. I have no commandment. He said, but I do have the spirit of the Lord. That's the slope. And you can extrapolate. It's eighth grade mathematics. You can extrapolate when you have the slope. You don't know where you are going to be on the y-axis, but if you know the x, and if you know the slope, and if you know the b, which is the y-intercept, and the y-intercept for us is the life of Jesus, if you know those numbers, you can extrapolate. And Paul said, 20 years after Jesus, I have no command, but I have the Spirit of the Lord, and I'm going to give an opinion. If we just realized how progressive Paul was and understood how to follow his hermeneutic, then we would do with Paul what Paul did with Jesus. And if he was doing that with Jesus 20 years after Jesus, what about 2,000 years after Paul? He found the slope and he said, I don't have a commandment from the Lord, but I have the spirit of the Lord and I'm going to speak by permission under the canopy of God's mercy because I may not get this right, but it's a pastoral decision. And he said, I don't think she has to wait on him to cheat on her. I think she can have peace. He goes on to tell slaves to stay slaves and virgins not to marry and widows not to remarry because of a present crisis that I'm pretty sure he thought was the coming of the Lord. But he concludes the chapter as a good progressive would by saying, I think I have the mind of the Spirit. You think? Even Paul didn't do with Pauline theology what the church has done the first 2,000 years. It was a pastoral opinion. And I think I have the mind of the Spirit for someone in their time. Brilliant. Yeah. Ptolemy was a brilliant astronomer. Sure. Copernicus and Galilei were brilliant. It's the idea that progressive revelation ended with the apostles. Yeah. I mean, Christian, Christianity loved progressive revelation as long as we were progressing on Judaism. But nobody gets to progress on us, and we don't even get to progress within us. Although we have, we just don't admit it. And that's why when people say, where did you get this hermeneutic lens to make homosexuality okay? I always tell my evangelical friends, from you. You're using the exact same hermeneutic selectively. And I pray not to your own personal ends and conveniently. Just use the hermeneutic you're already using on many texts for these people. Or, I so agree with that. I, I, I mean, a thousand percent that, you know, when our evangelical, orthodox, biblicists turn to us going, how can you think these things, whether it's a, a group of people or whether it's a particular, and I put in quotes, biblical... Right. theology, uh, which is, I'm not sure why they, they get to own the word biblical. Um, We've used a lot of Bible today. Yeah, yes, that's right. And, uh, but no, I think, 
I think the idea that faith evolving is not what's wrong with faith. Faith evolving and shifting is everything that's right with faith. And it's been happening since the beginning. Things that are alive grow, they yeah. evolve, they change, they transform. That's life. That's Zoe. Things that are dead are in stasis. And yes, I, I think, and really, what do I know? But I think, yes, we are in a, uh, we are moving towards a third millennium Christianity. Uh, theology, and it's shifting, and that's what's wonderful. And, uh, and Jesus said that the night before he was crucified. He said, I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear now. It wasn't that God was holding out. It was their incapacity. We've raised children. There were, th there were discussions I was having with my 14-year-old, my 7-year-old would say, what were y'all talking about? And I would say, just something between Bub and I. It wasn't that it wouldn't be true for her. It was, you don't teach calculus to a first grader. It's not that calculus isn't real. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you. And I think we assume there was this, like, ibid or asterisk that sent you to the bottom of the page of the footnotes that said, and all of that will be satisfied by the end of the first century, the death of the last apostle, the 27-book canonization, the creeds between the 5th and 8th century. That's not true. And nothing about church history indicates from the Pentecostal renewal to the Stone Campbell movement to the Protestant Reformation to the Anabaptists to the Jesus movement. We've always, and you don't have to wait till chattel slavery and women in ministry or the treatment of divorcees or queer people. Right out of the chute, the template is laid full of the Holy Spirit. The early church is convinced that 99.9% .9 of the earth's population has no access to the gospel unless they convert to Judaism. And they were wrong. And yet the book of Acts is not just this story about this powerful outpouring of the Spirit, but it's this human frailty of being able to be completely full of the Holy Spirit and not get inclusion right. And yet this beautiful capacity to be corrected and to argue with God and say no. and I mean, the brother of Jesus, James, and the elders in Jerusalem look at Peter and say, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people, much less baptized them. That's inclusion. But they got it right. They admitted they were wrong. When Jesus said, you have, you have, you have many things to learn, I have many things to tell you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll teach you. Well, the book of Acts certainly indicates that with the outpouring of the Spirit, there wasn't a download of every ounce of information. And it's a continuing process of revelation that we are getting, and it's not when God finally gets ready to give it to us. It's when human consciousness grows to the capacity that we can see some things that we would had no capacity to see before, and our hearts break. And I, I brutalized queer people in the name of Jesus. Saul of Tarsus was on his way to kill Christians. He could not have been more shocked when he heard a voice say, this is Jesus whom you are persecuting. I felt that when I heard from the bellies of queer people, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And all of a sudden, my righteous crusade for God was actually the filling up of the sufferings that were incomplete in Jesus. I was, I was executing the crucifixion of Jesus, which was incomplete in queer people. These were not my opponents fooled by Satan. This was the body of Christ I was torturing. And it wasn't, and, and, and when our side says, well, you finally love them. No, I always, it, it, it wasn't a lack of love. I didn't change my love for them. I changed my mind about Scripture. I saw God differently. When I saw God differently, I saw them differently. And I, I don't know how that happens for different people. I know how it happened for me. I can't impose that on anybody else. And I live at the intersection of two wounds, the severe wounds of queer people at the hands of the church 
And I don't expect my queer brothers and sisters to join me in the sympathy for the other wound, but I live at the intersection of another wound, and that is the wound of our people and the horrible things they've heard about God and themselves. Because when you are driven to the shadows, when you are driven by fear of God's footsteps to cover yourself in fig leaves, what you will do to those around you is unspeakable. And so I'm not just trying to change people's view about homosexuality or sexuality or sensuality or humanity. Ultimately, I'm just hoping that we could have a better vision of the divine and 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 spirituality and what all of this is because if if we get that right and we are the elder brother that feels the party of grace for ourselves I just I think we'll be so relieved we'll be glad to show up at everybody else's party yeah and I think Stan yes 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 I think uh let me end by asking you to give comment to to this um I asked Brian McLaren the same question, Pete ends the same question. You know, those of us who have shifted in our faith were often say, you know, very trite things like we lost the faith, we fell away from the faith, we walked away from the faith, or if we hold on to a faith that's an apostate faith, a heretical faith all these kinds of things. But I, I, I'm sitting with someone to me that I go, still has a big heart for God, still has a big heart for Jesus Christ, and someone from, you know, whom your Christian spirituality is still the center point of your existence. So, yeah, tell me, tell me about that. That what does your experience with Christ mean and still mean? What is your experience with your Christian spirituality? What do you experience? What does it still mean to you, regardless of what any critic? Sure, and I, because the first thing. When you're asking the question, my heart is leaping and wanting to say something that is so beautifully positive to me and meaningful and life-changing. It gives me comfort yesterday with, I'm with my mom who has dementia. And, and I, I was at a funeral earlier burying an old friend. My heart leaps when you ask the question. And immediately there's this suppression of, but if I say it, people I love will be mad at me or judge me. It's, it's amazing that tension that I can still feel. You mean if you express your if I express my If I express the way I see Jesus and Christianity... I'm asking you an affection question. Yes, what is my affection for Christianity? Or, or no, that, uh, that still could be delivered as a thought answer. No, not express... Uh, uh, it seems to me that you still have a deep connection, a deep attachment, a deep love for God that comes through your Christian spirituality. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah. I, I feel deeply spiritual. I, I can't help it. Spirituality concern about reflection on matters of ultimate meaning. Three things for me. Where did all this come from? I, I understand that mathematically it can be reduced 13.8 billion years ago to a space the size of an electron, but where did that come from? And if it was in the space, if it was compressed into the space the size of an electron, then that's dimensional, so there was something outside of that. What was it sitting in? What did it expand into? That's the stuff I call God, you know, not Burl Ives in the sky, but just that mind-boggling. How do you, how do, how do you 
one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, one sixty fourth, one one twenty eighth, one two fifty six. You can't get back to zero. There's no such thing. You can't get there. You can't. You can't get to nothing in either direction. And then the deep meaningfulness that I experience with people. There just seems something enchanted about all of this to me. And it leaves me awestruck. It leaves me hoping, as AJ said, hoping and dreaming that there's something deeply meaningful here and beyond and under and around. I just, I feel deeply spiritual. I'm mesmerized by all of that. I'm mesmerized when I'm holding my friend's new grandbaby the other day, and I was mesmerized when I saw a former NFL nose guard friend of mine turn the machine off on his three-year-old child. And I watched him stagger under the blows of grief. Dave, 300-pound body hit the wall and just slid down. And there was something. It was like the height of the mountain and the depth of the valley were the same thing. It was lament is love song, and love song is lament. And it's like, this cannot simply be organic only. It just can't be the firing of electrons. There is something enchanted about that. That's spirituality for me. That's who I am. I was given a language by which to navigate those feelings. I was given an alphabet, a lexicon, and a narrative, and a grouping of symbols called Christianity. Religion for me, whether it's Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, at their best, they are French, Italian, Russian, English, Spanish, Portuguese. They are languages. And how dare the speaker of Portuguese say to the speaker of French, you cannot communicate love and life. You cannot communicate valleys and mountains. You cannot speak scientifically or poetically in your language as well as we can in ours. How dare one language look at another language and say yours is insufficient Ours offers better syntax. Ours offers hope of grammar and explanation beyond yours. It's just not true. My mother tongue, my native religious tongue was Christianity. At some point, the use of that language, I mean, you can use any language for hate or love. And it was the use of my language that became dastardly through what it was conveying, fear and hatred and separation and estrangement and scarcity. So much so that I conflated the way the language was being used with the language itself. And I was like, well, I got to get rid of that language. And then I found out there's no language. I mean, some of the worst things being done in this world to queer people are being done in non-religious countries. This isn't all rooted in God. This is rooted in humanity and scarcity. I finally realized that Christianity was in itself intrinsically a language that had the capacity to speak loving things. And I have now chosen it as my lingua franca, my primary language. It's the language I cuss in when I hit my thumb with a hammer. It's the language that I exclaim in when I'm emotional and happy. It's the language I dream in. It's the language I speak when I come home. My mother tongue doesn't have to be my lingua franca, but for me, my lingua franca, I have settled in and said my mother tongue is a fine tongue. But my mother tongue and my lingua franca ethically demand of me to be multilingual and to appreciate all of the languages. And so... That's where I am with Christianity. I am not in love with my language, but I am in love with... And when I start trying to talk about my 300-pound friend hitting the wall and what it looked like to watch him collapse down that wall and later see him hold that child and juxtapose that against my mom leaving this world through dementia, all of those things, 
I can't help it. I, my mother tongue, I go back, you and I have been talking all day long about those kinds of existential realities. And my language is Genesis 1 and Genesis 3 and Prodigals and John 9 and Luke 7. And I don't doubt a bit if I would have been raised in a different part of the world with Sanskrit or another book that I could have used those languages to the same end. So that's where I am with Christianity. And thanks for being on my podcast. Man, thanks for having me. Yeah, and um, Stan, you have a you have great influence, a lot of things to say. So where can people find you? You know, oh, my life has pared down a lot. It's interesting how that happens. But the main place people can find me is on Facebook, believe it or not. And there's a reason for that. I am not a social media maven who's on all of the ele- you know all of the different expressions of social media for a reason my life and probably the last chapters of my life are devoted really to pastoral care and it's it's the thing i was always good at there were so many things i was bad at pastoring so many things i was bad at in you know leadership in churches but the thing I loved the most and the thing I was probably best at was just the the care of the soul and the one-on-ones and the coffees and the hospitals and funeral homes and weddings. And I really get to do pastoral care now at that intersection of gender sexuality and faith. And so the rubric is, Dave, I have a Facebook page and I just turned it over to the stories of my queer siblings because I realized as a cisgender, heterosexual, white guy, I had a lot of privileges. Most of them were kind of a social ill-gotten gain. And I could either jettison them and abandon them and say, I am abdicating any connection to them because I, I, I didn't deserve them. I got them on the backs of other people, people of color, women. But I decided instead of throwing away the platform, I realized I'm not a voice for the voiceless. The people that I serve have a greater voice than I do. My privilege was not that I had a voice and they didn't. My privilege is that I had a microphone and an amplification system. So I thought, what if I steward this ill-gotten gain by turning it over to them? So instead of doing waxing eloquent and putting sermons up and preaching sermons and doing theology, I just turned my social media page over to telling their stories. I handed the microphone, and when it when that happened... All of a sudden, the numbers started going crazy, but the real numbers are from all of the posts, whether it's you know 3,000 clicks and 800 shares, that's not the deal. Every day through the sharing of those posts, I get between 2 to 10 private messages from an Assembly of God pastor's kid in North Dakota who says, I'm dying, and I can't tell my mom and dad, and I need help, and those few people come to me and I send them back my number immediately and I just provide pastoral care for those that don't have a sparrow day or a grace point within 200 miles of them. Which most alone. don't. Most don't. And so that's all I do. And, and I do it on, I, I, so you can find me on Facebook and um, I just do pastoral care these wow. days and it's kind of, it's lovely. It's, it's, it's what I'm, it's what I love and it's, They say vocational satisfaction is, do you feel like your work is meaningful? Do you love it? And can you do it honorably? And I found my space. I found my space. Well, Stan Mitchell, so much we talked about, but so much more we didn't talk about. And uh, we'll have to do this again, but thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being my friend. Thanks for being my friend.